So Varga B, one of the leaders for small group two, showed her interest in leading a newsletter committee and accepted our invitation to become a chair for that committee. We plan to have a quarterly newsletter with the family partner section, um, the FCC related publication and commentary and a unit spotlight. Thanks Varga B for coordinating this great resource. Let me know if you have any other ideas or want to get involved in existing committees or form a new committee. We are open for any suggestions or feedback. The next we have family, two new family partners. Um, so that bringing our numbers to 15. Um, Betsy is the founder and executive director of the Hope for HAE organization. She offered insightful feedback about the lack of participation of term and late preterm families, as well as non-birthing family partners in our first webinar via Twitter. As a result, we have intentionally recruited non-birthing partners and added a webinar in October to focus on a late preterm and term family partners. Thank you, Betsy, for being vocal and sharing your valuable perspective. Next, we have Vishal. Vishal is an assistant professor in internal medicine at UT Southwestern in Dallas, Texas. He wears multiple apps. He's a practicing palliative medicine physician and a father to 32 weeks twin girls. One of his girls was born with Down syndrome and spent over four months in the NICU. He recently shared his powerful insights about family communication in his Twitter feed. We will be sharing this in our next newsletter, so be on the lookout. If knowledgeable medical professionals like Vishal felt the communication with families in the NICU is subpar, we have a lot of work to do in this task force. With that, I will hand the virtual platform to Caroline to talk about our FCC and small group update. Good morning, everyone. Um, so this task force was actually formed in November of 2021, for those of you who aren't super familiar with it or, or who are joining us for the first time. So we do have, as part of this task force, 37 hospitals who are sort of knee deep in this work. Um, they're from 21 states. Um, we also have two international hospitals participating. So those 37 hospitals, in addition to get to educational webinars, are meeting in five different small groups about every other month to really engage um, in you know, what our hospitals are doing, what progress they can make and to help each other sort of goal set and hold that accountability. All of those groups we're proud to say include family partners as well. Um, many of you found out about this webinar through our listserv. Um, we have over 200 folks now on that listserv, which is really exciting to see just the, um, the wide array of people who are really interested uh, in this topic and in promoting this in their local NICUs. Uh, we have an email account. Uh, if you have any questions, feel free to send us an email. If you hold your phone up to that QR code, it should take you to a Padlet site. That site is a great one to bookmark because it's where we'll sort of deposit um, an array of resources for you. So that's where all the recordings will be. Um, that's where some other information um, in terms of contacting our family partners or contacting us, it's all on there. Um, so feel free to sort of grab that as a QR code and go to the Padlet. I'll put the link in the chat as well a little bit later. Um, if you're on Twitter, you can find us at FCC Task Force. Uh, we would love to have, you know, if you have an interesting article that you've read, please do engage with us there. Uh, so I will now pass it over to Colby, who's going to work us, um, introduce us to our family partner panel. Thank you, Caroline. Hi, guys. I'm Colby Day. Um, it's nice to see you all. Thank you so much for joining us today. We're really excited about this webinar. Um, just to kind of set the stage, we have uh, six family partners who are going to um, be joining us for this first part of the webinar. And um, kind of like our last one, we have two set questions that we are going to um, ask each of our panelists, but we'd like this to be fairly informal. So please feel free to chat in other questions that you have. Um, if we don't have time to address all of the questions, we will be saving the chat. And it's some the um, unaddressed questions we can send to our family partners to be able to email out to our list serve some answers as well. Um, and then to our family partners who are um, about to participate, thank you so much for joining us. Um, 
Again, uh, for the first question, I'm going to ask you guys to introduce yourselves and then also to let us know why you think family-centered care and partnering with families in the NICU is important. Um, and, and since uh, so many people have their cameras on, which is fantastic, I'm just gonna call you guys each by name for this first question. And then once all of you have gotten a chance to answer, I'll ask the second one, but kind of leave that up to you to, um, to contribute as you, as you would like. Um, so uh, for our first family partner, do we have Megan um, Snyder on to go ahead and give us a quick intro uh, and also answer our question on why family-centered care is important? I'm here. Oh, perfect. Hi, Megan. Hi, how are you? Okay, so um, my name is Megan Snyder. I am the director of the Premier Parent Program, um, mentor program with Graham's Foundation. I became part of that program after my daughter was born at 28 weeks and five days due to sudden onset help syndrome. Um, she was born at a hospital that does not deliver 32 weeks and below. Um, we kind of caught them all off guard. They didn't have time to transfer us. And because of that, we ended up in different hospitals for five days and I didn't get to meet her until she was five days old. I was kept at the hospital where I was and she was transferred down to Pennsylvania Hospital in Philadelphia. Um, which leads me to why I think family-centered care is so important. I miss those first five days with my daughter. Um, I miss, as preemie parents know, we miss so much. So being able to be part of the care when we are there is so important to, to help us remind us that we are the parents. Because when I walked into that NICU, I didn't know which one was my baby. There's isolates everywhere. I had to be told. And, you know, that was that was heartbreaking. So being able to have a nurse say, hey, would you like to change your baby's diaper or would you like to take her temperature today? It meant the world and it and it did reinforce the fact that, yes, I was her mum. I mean, other people were looking after her most of the time and especially, you know, full time those first five days. And then I was still very sick, so I wasn't able to be there every day. So knowing that when I was there, I was her mum, I was participating, that, that to me, that's really huge. And we hear that from our parents all the time to, to kind of validate that we are the parents. So it's pretty much my main reason for family-centered care. Thank you, Megan. Um, can we have Nicholas Hall chat with us next? Yeah, sure. Hi, can you hear me okay? Okay, good. Uh, Nicholas Hall, so the founder of Graham's Foundation. Uh, my son Graham and his twin sister Reese were born on Thanksgiving Day 2006. Um, their mother Jennifer had a um, similar situation with Megan. And so I think I probably said we're delivered at 25 weeks, three days gestation. Similar experience um, with, with Megan in that um, I felt my experience was I felt that I had to be proactive in being involved as a parent, that I was it's like I had to press to to do activities that um, that could have helped, uh, could have helped and supported the bonding experience. And if we're thinking out beyond, um, you know, into the future, ultimately, um, as as survival rates continue to increase, more and more of those babies are gonna come home. And so ultimately we are, boom, we're gonna be left and we're all gonna be overwhelmed. Assume we are all gonna be overwhelmed and scared and frightened and what do we do? Because we've lost the safety net of the neonatal intensive care unit and all of uh, the wonderful doctors and nurses. And so the more that you can do to help train us parents so that we have as, as much confidence as we can um, going home. So I really see it as you are preparing us all to go home from the moment we enter that NICU. How can you help us um, you know, be empowered parents taking, taking our babies home? Thanks. Thank you, Nicholas. Um, can we hear from Dr. Mike Heinen next, please? Dr. Heinen, if you're talking, we, uh, you are muted. I think I'm unmuted now. There we go. Got me? <laughs> Perfect. I'd like to give you a little bit of context 
for my opinions about family-centered care is so important. So my son, Chris, was born at St. Mary's Hospital in Milwaukee, Wisconsin on July 28th, 1980. So that makes me the old timer in this group. Um, he will turn 42 in two weeks. My wife, Lauren, gave birth due to preeclampsia at 30 weeks gestation. And Chris was transported six miles to the only level three hospital in Milwaukee at that time, County Hospital. Well, in 1980, the vocabulary of the NICU did not include things like family-centered care or developmental care. In fact, developmental care back then was just stimulate, stimulate. But the three neonatologists at County had created a family-friendly environment that was very advanced for its time. In 1980, only about 50% of the NICUs in the United States allowed parents to visit. But at county, parents and grandparents were welcomed 24 seven and they didn't throw us out during rounds or uh, shift changes. And kind of as Nick was alluding to, they taught me some parenting skills. So they made sure that within the NICU that I bottle fed Chris when the timing was appropriate, that I changed diapers towards the end. And over the years, I've been given tours of many NICUs, and I've come to deeply appreciate small NICUs like County. At County, there were about uh, 15 beds in critical and eight in the, the transition. But after a week, my wife, Lauren, and I, we knew everybody on days. So the terror that we had from the beginning was buffered by familiarity and support from those people. We had a real primary care nurse. So I believe that a, a necessary ingredient to family-centered care is having a consistent relationship with caregivers with whom we as parents can develop a trusting relationship. And I think that as family-centered care kind of evolves, the emphasis must focus on relationships. So I'll leave it at that. Thanks. Thank you so much, Dr. Heinen. Um, can we have, and I apologize if I messed your last name up, um, Kimberly Novod, please let me know how to say it if that's not correct. That's exactly correct. Oh, great. <laughs> Okay, uh, so I'm Kimberly. Uh, I'm the founder and executive director of Saul's Light based in New Orleans. Uh, my son Saul was born in 2014 at um, 28 weeks and six days gestation. Um, he spent a little under a month in the NICU. Um, unfortunately, about two days after he was born, he developed um, an IVH, which is a brain, ble brain bleed, sorry. Um, and that's a level four brain bleed. So it's the worst one that you could possibly have. Um, and it was one that uh, obviously did not resolve on its own. So my son passed away um, shortly before he's a month old. Um, and I think that, you know, when I think back about our time in the NICU, I think it's really characterized by, um, a series of very like difficult conversations. And so I think that there are a lot of great instances um, of family-centered care within our NICU story um, and without it in our story, right? So I think that's something um, clinicians need to be able to do and sit with is how to deliver difficult news, how to draw back after you have delivered difficult news and allow families to process um, without much prodding and decision-making. Um, it's really very hard to sort of have a dream and an, and an idea for your family. And then in a matter of days, um, see that come to an end, you know, see that sort of like blow up in your face that it's not gonna happen. Um, and so for, for me, I would say, I think that family-centered care and partnering with families is, is the ultimate um, importance for hospitals and for doctors and nurses and, and all other um, healthcare providers. 
um, is because the families are literally at the center of your care. The baby is your patient, but the family is enduring the experience. Um, and so they are the ones that can actually give you that feedback, right? And so I think when you partner with patient families, you can find out if what you intend to do or what you set out to do is actually happening. Because if a family does not feel that they're at the center of care, then I think it's safe to say that they're not. Um, and so I think having open communication with families allow you to be a better care provider. Um, and so, you know, that's something that I'm, I'm happy to talk about. And I'm really glad to, to be with here, um, to be here with you all today to discuss that. Thank you so much, Kimberly. Can we hear next from Michelle Wrench, please? Hi, everyone. I'm Michelle. I am a NICU nurse um, for 17 years now, and also the mom of three daughters who were all born premature and in the NICU. Um, in 2015, my twins were born at 30 weeks due to preeclampsia. Um, and then uh, nearly two years later, I had my third daughter born at 35 weeks um, for the same reason, uh, but also required critical care in the NICU and then um, in the intensive care nursery for prematurity support. Um, and then a few years later, I also had um, the experience of being a PICU parent um, with two of our daughters re-hospitalized. So um, I uh, have a bit of a unique experience in that I can take my personal experience and everything that I learn in my involvement in family-centered care um, to the bedside and really can tell you that it improves my practice as a nurse every day um, just by listening to all of you. Um, and from my personal experience, I can tell you that uh, family-centered care is so critically important because that is where the relationship with your child begins. Um, being a parent is the most important relationship you'll really ever have in your life. And um, getting to nurture, be able to nurture that relationship very, from the very start is something that I feel very passionate with. And I hope that um, we can all help facilitate that. Um, and I you know, can tell you that I felt that lack in the beginning as well, even though I knew how important it was for me to get to the bedside and hold my daughters, um, my health didn't permit, permit me to do that. And, um, and also in the facility where I delivered, I think family-centered care can certainly be improved. Um, we know as healthcare professionals that parents being involved in the care of their babies, holding their babies, reading to them, bonding with them, improves patient outcomes. So we're doing this for uh, the outcome of the child and to help uh, facilitate their relationship and bonding with the parents. And um, we also know that this helps uh, improve maternal mental health outcomes by having families involved in the care of their child. And um, one of the things that I see in my practice all the time is that um, this helps build confidence um, for parents taking their NICU babies home. And not only confidence for taking them home, but caring for them in the NICU, um, letting them know that they're very important in the care of their child and that, um, that they need to be absolutely the center of, of care and be considered in decisions um, and just do everything that we can to help nurture that relationship from the very beginning and all the way through, even past discharge. Thank you, Michelle. All right, and can we hear from Jennifer Canvasser next, please? Hey, everybody, I'm Jen, and I am also the founder and director of the Necrotizing Intracolitis Society. My twins were born at 27 weeks gestation, um, and for the first six weeks of their lives, they were doing really well, and um, they were overcoming kind of all of the um, anticipated obstacles that many preemies um, born 
weighing about two pounds um, might face. And then Micah, one of my twins, developed necrotizing colitis and became critically ill, had multiple bowel resections um, and went into renal failure. He did get to come home and we had thought that he had overcome all of his most difficult battles at this point. Um, but then tragically he developed pneumonia and he passed away just before the twins first birthday. Um, so that's a bit about my story and how I got to where I am today. And in terms of why family centered care is so important, um, I did not feel like my twins mother when they were born, like obviously I knew I was, <laughs> but I didn't know how to be their mother is what I'm saying. And I really needed my care team. And I will say it's, it was my, our care team. Like it's not just my baby's care team. We are uh, a family unit. And I believe that in the NICU, you're not just caring for your, the babies, <clears throat> that you're actually caring for the family. And so I wanted and needed my care team, our care team, to really almost act like a mentor or a coach to me and show me how to mother and nurture my my children, my twins, that I was just even afraid to touch. I literally thought I was going to hurt them just by touching them or holding them or doing anything. I was just terrified and overwhelmed and scared and um, felt really guilty and ashamed of where they were and um, the situation and, and struggles that they were facing. I blamed myself, um, even though logically I knew it was not my fault. I did blame myself. And so um, I was really relying on my team to um, help me overcome all of those really difficult experiences that I was having. And then I also want to share that I do believe, despite all the insecurities that I and many parents have in the NICU, that we do know our children best. Um, I remember on countless occasions when I was able to recognize that something was really wrong with my twins before any alarms or anyone else could see that something was actually happening or wrong, nothing was beeping, but I knew that something was off, my baby was not doing well. Um, and so again, it's just really important to build those relationships, build that trust, that rapport, um, and nurture those um, connections between families and the healthcare team. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, thank you to all six of you for sharing your stories. I know this is probably difficult. Um, and so we really appreciate um, your willingness to um, kind of open up to us and, and help us to do a better job in the NICU. Um, one of the other questions that we wanted to ask um, is what is um, one thing or, or what are a few things that you really feel healthcare providers should know or improve upon in general in respect to family-centered care? Um, and this time I'm just going to let you guys answer, answer at will. Um, so please feel free to, to speak up and we'll monitor the chat for some other questions. We do have about 20 minutes just to let you all know before we'll, we'll have to move on to our next presentations. Um, but yes, please, please enlighten us. I, I would offer, um, this is Nicholas at Graham. So one of the things that I didn't discover until we were there, I was there every day for 119 days. Um, one of the things I didn't discover until probably being there for at least a couple of months, um, these rounds that y'all had talking about the babies and didn't know, didn't really know that it had existed, wasn't really. And so once I was aware and then I started sticking my nose in, I was able to actually then be a part of, okay, we're now gonna talk about Reese because at that point, Graham had passed away. And we're going to talk about Reese. And then I actually had the opportunity then to contribute. Like we, had, we could contribute what we were observing, what we were seeing. Because it's, it's everybody started talking about, you know, looking at the, the stats and, and sharing observations. And so being able to then be a participant in that conversation really made a significant difference. And so I would ask, are there things that, are there processes and procedures that naturally happen where simply inviting parents to, per, to potentially participate would actually create conversation. Because conver y'all have conversation, we're, all, we're talking all the time. Conversations are happening in the NICU all the time. But unless you're someone that is willing to be you know, proactive and stick your nose in like I was, you could, you could be there every day as a parent and not necessarily have, have the kind of conversations that could 
be in, that, that could help you feel inclusive. You can be there in person, but maybe not feel included. And so that, that would be kind of a question that I would ask, um, you know, are there opportunities where parents can be invited to participate and to just naturally help and that by and participating will help them feel more uh, an increased level of being of empowerment. Have our other family yeah. partners had a similar experience with that? Yeah, for sure. I definitely felt the same way, um, Nick. And I also feel like we need um, and want providers to draw us in and engage us um, when we're at the bedside. I think a lot of times we're not sure what we can and cannot do. Um, and we are almost sometimes looking for permission, but might be afraid or to ask. And so again, like as much as you can really encourage families to be hands-on and to be engaged um, um, as much as possible and also recognizing that there will be limitations that some families will be too overwhelmed or too scared to, to take that on or might not be able to be at the bedside because of their other commitments at home and responsibilities um, and, and other life needs. And I think just recognizing that there's just so many um, competing factors sometimes for NICU families and to just always assume the best intentions and that parents want to be at the bedside and that sometimes there's a lot of obstacles that are keeping families from being there. Jennifer, I just wanted to say that I, um, you know, I think that uh, one thing I have learned over my years of NICU nursing and being a NICU parent is, um, is reminding uh, new parents that they, um, they can be an advocate in their child's care early on. Um, and that's something that I will often say at the bedside now. Um, and I feel like sometimes parents need that permission, even though we feel like we shouldn't, that they should already know that. But I think having that reminder of you are this baby's mother, father, and it is okay to advocate for your child because I too have, um, have experienced what you experienced about knowing that there's something wrong before um, we're seeing it clinically. I have seen that as a parent and I have seen that as a nurse. And I, um, I tell parents that, that it's always okay for you to be an advocate for your baby because I want them to feel comfortable to speak up to me and say, hey, he didn't look like this yesterday, or I noticed this is different about him yesterday because maybe I wasn't working yesterday and I'm not gonna notice those differences, but the parents are and the parents are so valuable. Their observations are so valuable. Um, and, and I want parents to feel comfortable to speak up to me so that I can make sure that we're giving this baby the very best that we can all the time. And then, um, you know, if I need to also um, to bring that on to the neonatologist too, um, it's, it's all part of seeing the whole picture of taking care of that child. I agree. I want to bring in a little bit. Sorry, go ahead. No, you can go, Mike. <laughs> Thank you, Megan. A bit of a different perspective and one that does not uh, reflect my experiences in the NICU. Um, having parent support coordinators in the NICU and especially having a paid position for a parent support coordinator, I think is invaluable. Um, and this is based on talking with a number of different parents. And I hope that people like Bob Chico and Christy Love and people who have been actually walking through the, the halls of the, the NICU and talking with parents are smiling. Uh, the, I've been impressed recently. I just finished reading a book by a neonatologist, Annie John B.A. called Breathe Baby Breathe. And it describes her reactions and feelings about the the hospitalization and the duration of her, she's had two preemies. She's a neonatologist, uh, but one that was absolutely frightening. And the, uh, uh, the descriptions that she uses in this book are very, very raw and true for preemie parents. And 
Dr. John Vier's perspective is that the people that she wanted to talk to within the NICU, right, were not the social workers, not the other colleague neonatologists that she had, but she would want to be talking to parents who she had cared for previously, who were in a much better position to really understand her emotional reactions. So I think that, that having parental support from veteran parents was, uh, for me, something that ought to be included within the definition of family-centered care. So I'll let anybody else go ahead. I'm going to come back to what I was going to say, but on what you were just saying, I mean, obviously, you know, with grants, that's what I do. I run the mentor program. So right. that is something that is, you know, close to my heart. Um, and I do think that that's something that really needs to be available to all parents, um, whether that's within their own hospital, through other nonprofits, through us, however that gets to them, giving them that support. Because yes, at the end of the day, the nurses, the doctors, they are there for the baby and they can be there so much, a little bit for the parent, but that they haven't been in those shows. They've not been there. So having that there is, you know, being able to talk to someone that's been there, I think is really important. And that's obviously why we love what we do. Um, what I was about to say before though, is what we find a lot and when we talk to parents and myself as well, when my daughter was born is we're in such a fight or flight still, especially in that first week of the NICU that everything is so scary to us, every alarm, um, and maybe just base breaking, breaking down the basics. Like I didn't know that apneas and brach brachycardias were expected at certain gestations. So every time that happened, I thought my baby was gonna die, you know? So taking those little things that are obviously, cause a lot of nurses, they just come over and they stim or they turn off the alarm and it's like no big deal. And you're sitting there going, oh my God, what is happening? So just taking a second to kind of explaining, hey, this is what happens at this gestation. They're still learning to breathe. They're still learning, you know, things like that. Just kind of taking a little bit of extra time to kind of calm the parent and explain that to them from the start so that then they they do learn it's okay to ask questions they do learn it's okay to be an advocate and that no question is too silly because they don't know what's going on and you I mean you know you you have no idea you become a medical professional at the end of your NICU stay but especially that first week you're still very you have no idea what's going on and you're just scared so having the parents be involved as much as possible and being able to explain some of those basics to them is just super important. Um, I don't wanna interrupt if anyone else has something to add, but I wanted to um, respond to Colby's um, question in the chat about, is there anything that we potentially do that could inadvertently increase family stress and anxiety? And I wanna share an experience um, that happened to me when Micah, was really, really sick. Um, he had just had um, multiple bowel resections. So he his like belly was still healing from the surgery. Um, he, had, he was intubated. Um, he had multiple lines. I mean, he was just kind of a, a mess. His body was a mess. He was not alert. Um, and I had not held Micah in months, like literally months. He had been in this really horrific state. And um, they really wanted me to hold him. There was like this, there was a transition happening where they thought that it would be the great opportunity for me to hold Micah. And to be honest, if someone would have just like sat down and like looked me in the eye and said like, are you comfortable doing this? It's okay if you're not like, we want you to hold him. We know you want to hold him, but are you, are you okay doing this? But no one asked me, everyone just assumed that of course I wanted to hold my baby, which of course I did, but not in the state because it was scary and it was sad and it was hard. And I didn't even feel like I was holding him. I was feeling, I was holding all the medical equipment. I wasn't even holding my baby. I was holding everything that was attached to him. And it was such a process and ordeal for me to hold him. Like I was afraid that something was going to go wrong and that it would be my fault because I was trying to hold him. But I was also like, I didn't feel comfortable speaking up because everyone was really excited for me to hold Micah finally after so many months. And how could I say, I don't want to hold my baby? Like, of course I want to hold my baby. And so I think that was a situation that was stressful and really difficult for me and like I just remember like people taking pictures and me like trying to smile but I like how could I smile my baby was in, in such a dire state it was just a weird experience but no one stopped to pause and just like check in and like 
look, they give me a moment to just like answer the question, like, are you okay with this? And I think that is really important that anytime we do anything, I could send instead of just like assuming that this is what families want, like giving the moments to just check in and, and ask, like, is this something that you want to do? Like, are you comfortable? Are you okay with this? I think that's a really good point. And it's, um, uh, I hadn't even thought of it in, in that perspective. And so that's, um, I think that's a wonderful thing for us to hear. Um, one of the things I was also thinking about is there's a lot of chat about parent led rounds right now, which sounds amazing. Um, the caveat to that is I would hate for a stressed parent to suddenly feel like they have yet another responsibility um, of, you know, something that they needed to prepare, even that if that wasn't the intention of the team. And so I'm curious for institutions that have done parent-led rounds, how you kind of navigate making that a positive experience without making it stressful. Yeah, I can share uh, my view, Colby. And I'm sorry if, can you hear me? Okay, so I borrowed a template from Mary Beth Fry when I met her in our Vermont Oxford Network. So then we used that modified for our parents. So and then when I gave it to the parents and some families, they present this documentation. It's just a basic information of how the baby is doing in the past 24 hours and what, how is the feeding going and what is your perspective? How do you think the baby? There's no numbers involved. They just are giving their uh, view. Um, so then we will um, continue our numbers and plan and everything. So it's just a, not everybody is comfortable doing it. Just only few parents, they were able to do it in the beginning. And I offer them every week. Um, and if they are interested, then I can just go ahead and then give the template. If they are not interested, then I won't um, ask them. Yeah. I had an experience uh... It's been probably 10 years ago now, but visiting a neonatal intensive care unit in South America. Um, so you might consider it, you know, kind of second, third world country, um, national healthcare system, one, one payer provider system. But um, what was really interesting was one, because they didn't have as much and have the level of staffing that you but even, you know, you would have here in the U.S., parents were expected to actually be at the NICU. Many of them didn't have the funding to go back and forth, like it'd be too expensive. So they had, um, you know, I mean, here we have to have a, we have to have a Ronald McDonald house, but there it was like, no, they had rooms. And a lot of them were kind of shared living spaces, right, where um, and it was mostly, it was, it was mostly the mothers that were there, but I think they wouldn't be having a conversation on family-centered care. It just was, <laughs> it's what was necessary. Like that was, you know, that's the deal. That's what we need. That's what, that's the way it has, you know, that's the way it has to be. And then you can just imagine like the bonding then that happens between the parents and the communication that happens between the parents. And you just, they just, you know, we all end up supporting each other um and caring for one another and i've got to believe that those parents are prepared um when when it's time to take the baby home that they um again that's not our u.s based system um you know if i could wave a magic wand i think the mother should be connected to their baby until it's of you know, of age, of no longer being a fetus, and it's actually a baby. Um, and so, but that's that's a topic for a whole other, whole other, a whole other meeting. Um, but that, that's where I kind of go back to that. You know, being able to, and where can we work with what we have? But um, the systems that we have, and if we have, if it requires creating a whole nother thing, it's likely. To probably not not be successful because we all deal every day with one more thing, and those you know when it's not like core to our business, when it's not core to what our deliverable is, it's difficult to maintain whatever that is. Um, so you know rounds are core to what you all what you do in a NICU and as part of communication. So that's you know why I think 
finding ways to include the parent into something that's core to what you do already has has a shot right has a has a possibility i think someone has their hand raised i see kristen has her hand raised yes yes so i would like to recommend to continue to encourage parents um what the role is but also help them feel comfortable when it comes to touching their baby. Um, my husband was down in the NICU for about a day and a half before I was able to because I was in ICU. So when I went down, I just sat there. They all assumed I knew what to do. My husband went in to touch and I of course pulled him back and was like, no, don't do that. And so I made him second guess because I was, uh, showing my fears to him and every like the nurse that we had she just assumed that i had seen him already and i had been down there and so just reiterate to families and make sure that they're educated on how to do the touch hold if their baby's on a ventilator or what they can do don't just assume that they already know i think that's a fantastic point thank you kristen um, and we've had some interesting things in the chat as well. It sounds like there's some centers that are very advanced in what they're able to do in terms of involving um, families in care. Um, so certainly we can learn from each other. We do have about five minutes max before we're going to have to switch over. So I want to make sure if our family partners have other ideas of, of how we can do better um, as, as caregivers in terms of providing family-centered care. Definitely now is the time to to speak up. Hey everybody, it's Kimberly again. I want to um, re-emphasize, I feel like what at least three people have already said um, is about communicating with families and not assuming. And so, you know, that being said, I just want to move it towards thoughts of equity and how when we make judgments or assume things about people, we can be missing a lot more um, about their story and their family and what they're bringing into the hospital at that moment. Um, so in particular, we shouldn't assume that um, what families know, for example, um, we can't look at a family and tell what they understand, or we can't assume that because maybe this mom or dad or um, the grandparent is a lawyer and um, this person is not, means that the lawyer is going to have a better time understanding, right? None of us, as far as parents, um, are neonatologists, are nurses. So we're all starting from scratch, and it's the same bar. Um, secondly, I don't think we should assume, for example, when families aren't present to be with their babies. In our work, we can see that many of times families don't come and aren't able to spend time and actually be involved in any sort of family-centered care um, has to do with poverty for a lot of reasons, it has to do with money simply, being able to afford transportation or gas back and forth to the hospital. In addition, we shouldn't assume which families we think need um, support. I think all NICU families need support. That support is gonna vary and that is you know, on the part of the caregivers and social workers and community organizations like Salt Light, um, but we should never assume that a family needs support or doesn't for that matter. All families should have equitable access to um, information and resources so that they can be present and involved in their baby's care and that they can be the best advocates for their babies. Um, and they might not be able to do that if we assume, for example, here's a family that looks like it is well-educated and high income, so we don't have to worry about them. That family could be struggling the most with their mental health, um, for example. And then the, the last thing that I wanted to um, say, because I, I live in the aftermath of loss, um, is that in cases of loss, it's really, really important to take your time um, and decisions don't have to be made imminently, especially when um, a child's death is going to be the outcome anyway. Um, so a short story I'll tell you is that we worked with a family um, that child had a 
terminal um, prognosis, I guess is the word, forgive me if it's not. Um, but every single day that family was approached about what are you going to do? What decision are you going to make? Are we going to, you know, discontinue the, um, you know, different interventions? Um, and so this mom, she used the phrase um, when she was talking to me, it feels like they're hitting me over the head with this, you know, so she had to come to terms that her baby was never going to leave that hospital. Um, and so, you know, what she really needed was just time to process. And so she should have been given that time. And if, you know, if her baby is going to die anyway, if I may be frank, um, and I've lost a baby, so I think I can be frank. Um, if it's going to end up in death anyway, then why not give a family 24 hours, 48 hours, 72 hours um, to just be? Thank you, Kimberly. Those are um, really important points. So thank you for bringing them up. Um, Jennifer, I saw your hand was up. Um, you yeah. can be our, our closing out family partner for oh, this session. Okay. Um, I want, I, everything that Kimberly said, I, it totally resonates with me. Um, I also just want to emphasize the importance of um, like palliative care, if and when possible. That was something that I had access to and really appreciated um, that trust and rapport and relationship that I was actually able to build over many months of Micah's life. Um, so that's a whole nother story. But what I wanted to mention really quick is how I think it's important for us and for everyone who is a healthcare provider to be mindful that it's easiest to connect with families who we relate to, who look like us, who we see ourselves in. And when we do that, then we're building the relationships and rapport and trust with, with a very probably more limited amount of families. And so it, it takes um, us being more intentional uh, to ensure that we're not just connecting and spending more time kind of chit-chatting with the families that we feel a sense of connection with, but really um, get, providing that opportunity to have that kind of deeper level of engagement with all families. Um, I'll end it. Thank you. That's a that's also a really important point, and I think something we should um, we need to be more intentional about. Um, I am going to have us transition over to the next part of our webinar, but I would like to encourage our family partners to please continue um, uh, answering things in the chat as questions come up. If you feel comfortable and um, giving your thoughts as well. Um, next, we are going to have a talk by um, Dr. Jessica Fry and uh, Dr. Carrie Mashoot. Uh, Carrie, I apologize if I am mispronouncing your name, um, but I want to just give a quick introduction for both of them. Uh, Dr. Jessica Fry is an assistant professor of pediatrics at Lurie Children's Hospital of Chicago and Northwestern University. Her clinical work is with the divisions of neonatology and palliative care, as well as with the Lurie Ethics Program. Dr. Fry's research focuses on communication and decision-making for critically ill newborns, including parental perspectives on care. She's looking forward to speaking today with Dr. Carrie Mashut about her experience as one of the co-founders and leaders of the Lurie NICU Family Partnership Council. And uh, as for uh, Carrie, as an academic neonatologist and assistant professor at Lurie Children's Hospital of Chicago, Dr. Mashut's passionate about supporting infants and their families on their NICU journeys both clinically and through research and initiatives focused on improving family-centered care. She leads various initiatives in this domain, including family support, continuity of care, telehealth, care of infants with bronchopulmonary dysplasia, and the transition to home, both locally and nationally through the AAP and the Children's Hospital's Neonatal Consortium. Her research in this domain evaluates family perspectives and patient outcomes related to continuity of care and the culture of family-centered care. Her longitudinal career goal is to identify and implement strategies that increase family engagement, shared decision-making, education, and empowerment to improve the care of high-risk infants. So thank you, uh, Dr. Fry and Dr. Mashoot. Uh, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Colby, for those introductions. And thank you all. It's really hard to follow the family partner group. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> but Thank and you. also knowing too that there's so many people on this call from other centers who've just done uh, remarkable work, you know, whether we've read your work or heard about you and um, a lot of centers that are probably much further along in this journey than uh, we even are, and, uh, but gives us something to strive for. So thanks to all of you for the inspiration. That being said, we're excited to share our local experience today. So if you don't mind moving to the next slide. You. I thought we'd begin at the beginning. So Carrie and I discovered in some early joint conversations that we really have shared interest in published models of family-centered care. And I know that a couple people in the call, both in the chat, and I think Dr. Heinen 
um, verbally mention the work of Annie Jean Vier in Montreal, and we we too are, are really admire the work that she's done promoting the involvement of veteran NICU families within um, all aspects of clinical care. Uh, we discovered that we really have a joint commitment to making better the experiences of parents and families within our NICU. And we bring to this shared partnership a prior clinical and academic work that focuses on parent communication, decision making, and perspectives on continuity of care. We realized as we talked about our local experience that there's multiple existing hospital resources, and the next couple of slides will show you some of those, focusing on our local patients and family experiences. But with all of those different existing hospital resources, there was really no established way to incorporate NICU parent voices specifically into any developing clinical policy or academic initiatives. Parents really didn't have a seat at our table. And even to think like, so, so we had just, you know, anecdotally through our work in day to day life in the NICU had noticed gaps in family centered care and family support. And we had so many ideas, but we recognized that all of those just for us to implement or even with us to implement with our multidisciplinary colleagues would be really short sighted if we didn't actually ask the parents what they wanted. And that was a really common theme that came up on the last part of the session was that it has to be individualized. Like we can't just assume that something, even though it might seem like a very pro family or pro infant type of care or model that, um, that that's maybe actually not best for that individual family. And so we we knew that we'd be remiss if we didn't build something systematic to aid us you know, um, along our journey to, to improving these things locally. Thank you so much. Next slide, please. So just as a brief overview, because we really did think that personalization was important, a brief overview of our Lurie NICU. Um, it is a 64-bed mixed acuity, acuity room, unit with all with private rooms that's fairly busy. We have approximately 500 admissions a year. 12% of those come from our emergency department. Um, close to 40% come from our delivery hospital or connected delivery hospital next door. And the remainder come from various uh, community hospitals in the Chicago land area. We have a fairly significant average length of stay at 54 days and babies come to us for all sorts of, of reasons. Babies come to us because they're born prematurely as low as 22 weeks gestation. And they might go on to stay with us for a year plus of age. Um, many babies are admitted for surgical interventions or for respiratory care. Next slide, please. As I mentioned, we really do have a lot of resources that have been developed for the support of babies and their families. We have a dedicated bronchopulmonary dysplasia program. In the last couple of years, we really have been honored to develop a care coordination program where inpatient care coordinators go on to provide seamless outpatient transitions and are able to partner with families who need complex medical care, both inpatient and outpatient. And that is actually a family generated idea and a, a family that led that whole uh, foundational support for that program. We have a fetal health center, which involves an active, oh, please sneak back. A fetal health center that involves an active fetal surgery program and, and many resources that are at, at many other NICUs, but specifically we do have um, locally a Lurie Family Advisory Board. So there was a, a perspective on veteran family partnership within the hospital, just not much in the way of NICU representation. We also had a dedicated nursing led uh, NICU Family Experience Committee that was taking parent feedback and trying to incorporate them in some limited ways, but without sort of direct family voices. This was all through survey based. Yeah. No parents were on that committee, it's just a nursing committee. And not mentioned on this slide, we also do have the support of a group called ParentWise, where there are veteran parents that provide peer to peer support throughout the, the entire hospital of Lurie. Again, with some interaction with the NICU, but not necessarily as many direct connections as we thought could be potentially helpful. Next slide, please. So to begin somewhere, we thought we'd start with data to try to get by and we wanted to hear from our local families what their current experiences with family support and family centered care were at Lurie. Um, and to do this, we surveyed families now two years ago about family support with a survey that was sent to them about two weeks or performed about two weeks after their hospital discharge. And we learned quite a bit from that data, but these were our main takeaways. And um, this first point is something that I think was echoed in the first part of the webinar, that family support and family experiences really do need to be personalized because they mean different things to different people. Our survey was done in the early months of the COVID-19 pandemic and COVID did change the experiences of support. 
We also recognize that it's probably changed things moving forward. Some of the, the changes that happened will, will continue on for the immediate future. Um, families identified multiple areas for improvement and emphasized that connections with other uh, NICU families are, are truly important. And because this was one of our, our underlying kind of hidden agenda items, we asked specifically about including a resource or veteran parent program. And the vast majority of the parents that we surveyed were strongly in favor of such a program. Next slide, please. I'm just going to mention these quickly. These were the different types of support that we pulled out as themes from families' answers, from questions about what families found helpful, what families found lacking. And so these six different types of support um, were the ones that families emphasized as important. Many of these, again, were mentioned in the earlier part of the call that communication and education are a means of support. Relationships with NICU staff are an important means of support. Um, there were some dedicated hospital or NICU-based programs that were designed specifically towards family support that families recognized. Uh, things like material assistance with parking or the Ronald McDonald House or, or food that was provided through the NICU. Um, help outside the NICU from friends or family. And finally, a really big emphasis on connections made with other NICU families. How important it was to connect with families who had walked in your steps, essentially. Next slide, please. So kind of with this, we were able to demonstrate to our hospital and making leadership that we really needed to do better and that we had to have parents right next, you know, right alongside us as we did this. Um, fortunately, we were, you know, really garnered support with this. Um, and um, so we were able to build our, you know, first family true partnership. This really just started, I mean, we, we've started this now for um, the survey, I guess, was a couple of years ago. Um, but we started kind of building this um, almost two years ago in the fall as well. Um, one of the leaders actually suggested rather than being called a family advisory board, that it really should be a family partnership to really emphasize that key role that families were, were right alongside us, that they weren't just advising us on what we should be doing. They were true partners in this work, um, and which we gladly welcomed. And then the hospital actually went on to change their name. And so now they're the Lurie Hospital Family Partnership as well. Um, we started with a multidisciplinary staff group, um, and people were really excited about it, actually, which was great. Um, we had almost every discipline kind of represented, and people really um, were quite dedicated and invested to getting this built from the beginning. Um, we kind of set some meetings just to plan this before we actually um, brought parents in. And one of those, actually a couple of those meetings, were really trying to identify the parents. Just in terms of group dynamics, it's hard to have a, a huge group. So we um, kind of sat up with a group of like 10 parents we thought would be a reasonable place to at least uh, pilot. Um, we wanted to make sure parents had been at least a year out from discharge, just um, knowing that that NICU experience is so traumatic for most families uh, that we certainly didn't want to uh, cause any more trauma by putting them too close to that experience. I also knew that that first year your home is obviously so busy with a baby, especially one of any sort of... Um, medical complexity or health conditions. Um, we really wanted a diverse group. We wanted to make sure we reflected the demographics of the patient population that we serve. We are in an urban setting. And so we have a, a very diverse patient population. Um, we also wanted to have a representation of the clinical spectrum that we serve. So being a referral center uh, without uh, babies actually being born at our hospital, although we do have a a lot of preterm infants. We also have a lot of infants with surgical needs and other um, um, birth defects and things like that. So we really want it to be broadly representative, broadly representative, given that we we're still only going to be having about 10 parents. So um, this is kind of what we um, have strived for. It's not been perfect yet. Um, we have a large non-English speaking population uh, of families that we serve. And this has been like one, just one example of one area that's really been hard to pull in just in in the way that we're conducting our meetings over Zoom and um, in small group dynamic to have translation services. Um, so those there are, it's, we're still a work in progress, I guess is what I'm trying to say. We've also struggled with trying to recruit families who only stayed with us for a shorter period of time because mm -hmm. we're relying on sort of staff interactions and relationships that were built. And those tend to happen when families stay for, for longer. That does, I, um, and then we were fortunate to be able to have our overall hospital um, kind of volunteer process um, work with these families to go through a brief orientation just so that families could, you know, understand the importance of confidentiality and, um, and being sensitive to, to the whole group as, as we worked together. Uh, and that was a really helpful process to have um, in launching our group. Next slide. 
And so, um, you know, it's it's pretty simple. I would say, you know, we meet monthly. It's been all on Zoom so far. Um, we started officially a year ago in June, um, and it's just been it's just been wonderful. We really um, started. We first of all, we decided to let the parents choose when they wanted to meet, and they picked an evening time. So it's you know the third Tuesday of the month at seven o'clock. Um, and we really just started with their stories and just listening to them. It was very open-ended and it took three meetings just to get through 10 parent introductions. And it was wonderful. We had to see so many of our former patients actually pop in the screen uh, and got a Zoom bomb and it was really fun. And their dogs and their other kids and um, really get introduced to their lives. The staff all made brief introductions as well. Um, once we kind of you know, heard their stories, Jess and I kind of on the side, we're doing some, you know, loose qualitative analysis to try to pull out some of the themes that we were hearing. Um, and then we reflected this back to the group and we said, you know, this is kind of what we heard from you. Here's all these ideas and here's all these areas that need to be improved. Is this right? Did we get it right? You know, is this what you really were saying? And then from there, um, we said, you know, let's build some projects over time. And again, we're looking at this for decades to come. So let's start with one thing and we'll build from that. And we really um, had parents kind of pick a project and I'll show you an example in a minute. Um, so, sorry. No, I just wanna add that that um, organic focus was really intentional. We really wanted this to be parent-led. We really wanted to meet families with what they thought was the most important and um, key improvements that should be made in our review. Mm -hmm. So that, the beginning um, was really the way that we wanted to start out. Um, so yeah, so here we are officially just over a year in. Uh, we've had almost 300 volunteer hours between staff and our families participating in these calls and other work on the side. Um, we have, we're deep into our first parent project. In fact, we had something exciting, I'll share about it today. Um, We've um, launched another research study. Uh, in fact, we have Sophia Strine, who is an undergraduate student at Colby College in Maine, who is here with us for the summer, um, helping us recruit families. We're trying to study the actual culture of our family centered care here at Lurie. And so we um, launched a new research study in June. And she's, Sophia has been instrumental in getting that going. Um, and we're gonna actually have a gratitude celebration and to honor kind of our first anniversary of this group with an in-person gathering, as long as everything stays well, but we have an outdoor venue planned at the, um, the, the zoo here in Chicago um, that the hospital's gonna support. And we're gonna bring our families in if they wish their, their children back. Um, so we're really excited to thank them in that way with a little celebration. Um, go to the next slide, which I think, um, Kind of shows these were the big themes that really came out of areas that needed to be improved on from parents and when they um, kind of went through them again they really decided they wanted to do something to improve the transition to home piece um, so this was their idea um, and if you go into the next slide they uh, really wanted to build a parent-to-parent -parent kind of guide like tips and tricks from somebody who had been there you know obviously the hospital as i'm sure all of yours do have extensive educational modules in different ways um, but the parents still felt that something was missing to really hear it from another parent's um, words. And so they built this. It's a, I don't know how many, it's probably like 40, 50 yeah, 50 something pages. They curated this content over the last, I think they really started on this in November. And I think by April, you know, through several renditions and, and we as staff all kind of waited on different parts. Um, they built the content. And then we have an, um, kind of a great team here at Lurie that does health literacy um, review for all sorts of patient focused materials. So then they took it and then they made it kind of shiny with the logos and, um, and have kind of reformatted and everything. So they kind of did the grunt work so that the parents didn't have to do that. Um, and they just finished it. So we need to actually take this back to the parents and have them make sure they approve. We're having to translate into Spanish, uh, have our legal team sign off on it, those kinds of things. But this will be a guide um, available for families that is all um, give, you know, for all families that was directed by families. This was specifically designed to for families who do have longer stays or who have children who are going home with medical complexity. Yeah. Uh, at the back of it is kind of a place to take notes and it's going to be a really nice, it'll be, a, you know, kind of a binded paper thing that's available for families, but we're going to also have it available to them digitally on our website. Um, and then the families also kind of brought up the idea that it would be great to have some videos to really hear a family say, this is what it was like for me when I went home, or I wish a family had just told, I wish I had just been told X, Y, Z. And so we have an AV department here at Lurie, and we asked them um, if they would support um, 
building some videos. And so um, we're going to have schedule some of our families into the hospital to kind of talk about whatever they want to talk about in terms of, and they kind of outlined some of these um, videos that they want to do. And we actually, one was like to just actually show a family going home. And so actually just this morning, we were able to um, video a family of this little guy who's been in the hospital for 11 months. Um, his twin brother had passed away earlier on in his course. And um, it was just the most heartwarming thing. We were all in tears celebrating discharge and then also able to capture this both for that family, um, which I think is a meaningful keepsake for them. But uh, it was such a heartfelt moment that I know, I mean, I don't, I guess I shouldn't know, but I, I hope that it um, gives our future families um, a lot of inspiration and um, optimism about getting their child to that part of the journey. I think the very last slide is one example slide from our guide. Oh, yeah, that's right. Just as an example that you guys can take a peek at to, to see the types of things that are out there for from a parent perspective. Things about what it's like to have durable medical equipment dropped off at home. Things that we don't get to see as providers within the hospital, but are truly important in terms of moving forward after leaving the NICU. So we're really excited. First project. Thank you guys for yeah. hearing this experiment or this experience. And uh, we look forward to more. Thank you, Thank everyone. you so much. I apologize. Awesome. I have to actually run to a um I have a patient that's scheduled. So I'm gonna um but Jess is I'll around if there's any other <laughs> questions and then I will catch up um, afterwards. So thank you guys so much. Thank you so much. I think for the sake of time, we may move on to our next presentation um, and then if we have time we'll have questions at the end and um, so now we're going to hear from El Camino Health. Uh, so Dr. Shiva Kumar has been with El Camino NICU uh, at Stanford for over two decades. She is currently a clinical professor of pediatrics at Stanford uh, and the medical director of El Camino Health NICU. Dr. Shiva Kumar's training and experience in high-risk infant follow-up led to the development of the Family-Centered Care Program in the NICU uh, back in 2016. Um, Dr. Balasundaram is a clinical associate professor at Stanford, as well as a staff neonatologist at El Camino Health. Her passion is to provide safe and quality neonatal care in a family-integrated NICU, um, and so built the comprehensive family-centered care in her NICU. She formed the task force uh, and has created this networking opportunity for NICU interested in family-centered care. Thank you so much. I'll pass it over to you guys. Slide, Caroline. Yes, uh, this is yeah. the she. Um, now we are going to share our journey of providing family-centered care in a smaller community level clinic here. This slide shows the importance of family-centered care recognized by AAP policy statement. So not only parents and healthcare professionals thinking about it, but even AAP has recognized it. Next slide, please. Uh, we all um, worry about US News and World Report and you can see there are highlights on family-centered care and parent-to-parent -parent support, advisory committee, and kangaroo care are also scored by the US News and World Report. Next slide, please. So we heard from the uh, families how they felt. And here as a physician, I'm going to say my take on what is care in the NICU. Uh, we all worry about the infant, the preterm infant, who is the patient. When we focus on the care, two important issues come to our mind, acute medical problems and long-term medical and developmental issues. Parents are always worried about both, and these emotions cause stress and trauma. We are providing care, not only the infant, but also the parents. As neonatologists, we generally address the acute events and the management when we speak to the families. And that is important. There's no doubt about it. But how many of us during this conversation address the importance of parental involvement in the care of these vulnerable infants? Supporting staff address both issues, especially the therapist and developmental team, if you have them in your team. 
even though it is necessary to inform the parents their child's medical issues, we should also provide them with some tools to cope with the stress and trauma they feel. Every expecting couple has many dreams of their unborn child. When they have preterm birth, not only the dreams are shattered, but now they are frightened with many uncertainties. As, you, Nick, as NICU providers, we should support the parents to overcome the fear, anxiety, and trauma. Provide them with the tools to enjoy moments of baby time when they visit their infant, which we heard from many families today. Support the families in their NICU journey and beyond by introducing peer support through veteran parents. I think that is so important. Next slide, please. Now, if you take this family, both parents worry about their child. We always focus on mother, but the father worry about the infant and the mother because he has to support both. This leads to stress and trauma in both of them, not only the mother, but also in the father. Then mother has additional postpartum hormones that increase the effects of the stress. And what happened with all these stress leads to mental health issues. Postpartum depression, we all have seen in the NICU, tears of families and especially mothers when they are at the bedside. That tells you they are developing some kind of postpartum depression. Postpartum anxiety, which happened near discharge. How many times we have heard parents saying, do we need to take the baby tomorrow? Can I have another day? That is the anxiety that's coming up. The one that we don't see unless we follow them post-discharge is the post-traumatic stress, which you will hear from many mental health professionals talking to you. That happens three to six months after discharge. So all these are happening because of the stress and trauma they go through in the NICU. Next slide, please. Now we have to say, when we talk about family-centered care, who are the stakeholders? You have to bring the senior hospital administration, also the hospital patient experience team into there. But NICU-specific family advisory board is so important to have, and that is, important and also bringing nurses, ancillary staff and physician with families into your team. Next slide, please. So I will say, start the journey by establishing NICU specific family advisory board with veteran parents and actively recruit yearly that we, you have to do depends on your unit, what you do yearly to bring them back. And also during the pandemic, we heard and we learned that virtual meetings can happen. And now we will always do hybrid type of meeting. Next slide, please. What is family-centered care? The so components of comprehensive family support in the NICU has six components, as you see here. The first is staff education and support. You need to have your staff with you to run this journey. Followed by family support and peer buddy, as I mentioned, very important. While the infant in the unit, developmental care for the infant and mental health support for the parents. If the infant survives, we need post-discharge follow-up. In an unsuccessful journey, we need palliative and bereavement support. Now I will ask my colleague and the FCC chair, Malati, to describe the program in detail. Thank you. Thank you, Darshi. I will be sharing our six years journey of uh, building this comprehensive family-centered care program. Um, we have built four out of six components in this slide. We educated staff, as Darshi mentioned, on every stage of the program development through didactic sessions, creating poster boards and training during annual professional development day. We are 20 bed community level three NICU and cares for any babies 23 weeks and above. 
and we are open bay unit with average 400 NICU admissions per year. Next slide, please. There are a few different, different ways we can incorporate FCC in the NICU that are listed in this slide. I will go through each section in the next few slides. Next slide, please. I want to briefly touch upon the prenatal consultation and emphasize the FCC during that time. Antenatal consult is usually the first contact parents have with the neonatal team. Prenatal consultation in the periviable ages needs a careful collaboration among all healthcare providers. Many neonatologists view their primary role as information providers and inconsistently address social and parental issues. Parents want written documents, handouts about what they can do for their baby and how NICU works. Next slide, please. With that in mind, we implemented our antipartum intervention. We created a visual tool such as an ebook, ebook loaded onto iPads funded by Family Advisory Board. We informed the obstetricians, perinatologists, and staff about the existence of the iPad. The ebook has NICU tool videos and wall stories, and neonatologists provide these iPads to the families during the prenatal consultation. Parents review the content at their own pace. On the right is the screenshot of the ebook table of contents. Next slide. Here are a few examples of our wall stories. Next slide. So the next after NICU admission, I should be focusing on communication with the birth mom. Initial maternal communication is limited and a spouse or partner relays most information and updating the birth mom immediately after delivery and emphasizing early hand expression of colostrum is crucial. This graph shows our implement work in 2018. Four years later, our amazing neonatologist team, neonatologists continue this work and it is a standard of uh, care in our unit going back to the labor and delivery and updating the birth mom. Next slide, please. So we have different subcommittees to em emphasize staff involvement and staff being aware of family-centered care, which are listed in this slide. Next slide. So having a regular parent support group is one way of emotionally supporting parents as we heard nice and loud and clear in this uh, panelist discussion. Um, so we will be discussing this in detail during the November webinar. We meet monthly and during the pandemic, we met virtually or in an outdoor setting, which is shown in this picture. Next slide, please. Another kind of support that we created for our unit um, specific is a local NICU community um, called a Slack workspace. We created a unit specific Slack workspace. So parents support each other by participating in group discussions if they are not ready for one-on-one -on -one connection. Next slide, please. So moving on to providing early and effective discharge preparation. Quality of discharge teaching is the strongest predictor of discharge readiness. So we formed a discharge task force in 2017. We created a discharge ebook and we then integrated that ebook into electronic health records, EPIC. Parents review this information um, as early as possible, the time of admission and at their own pace um, in their NICU stay. Parent report of discharge readiness score improved in Prescani survey. On the right is the screenshot of our ebook on how to use the bulb syringe in a picture format, written description and video link. So the parents can choose the way they want to learn. We were able to sustain the work two years later with the help of our unit clerks who activate the MyChart bedside at the time of admission. And it translated into Spanish as well. Next slide, please. This flow diagram shows different subcommittees and their role in providing sensory family integrated developmental care. These developmental activities are a proxy for FCC metrics. Our next step is to measure actual parental involvement in these developmental activities. 
I will briefly go through each activity. And unfortunately, I won't be able to elaborate on each project. If you have any specific questions on any of our work, please feel free to reach out to us. First, we focused on improving early colostrum care and early use of mother's own milk by implementing early hand expression of colostrum by creating a multidisciplinary team in labor and delivery in NICU and postpartum unit. And in 2019, 19, the team focused on improving early skin-to-skin um, -skin care and keeping the babies out of the isolate by doing skin-to-skin -skin care or swaddle hold, either by staff or parents. Then following year in 2020, we worked on providing language nutrition by introducing a reading program that either staff or parents read to baby for 10 minutes per shift. And last year, and we focused on increasing parental awareness of the infant massage program. Next slide, please. This slide shows some of the handout materials we used for our developmental care work. On the left is the hand expression handout with the QR code for video link. And below is the first skin to skin care certificate that we offer to the both the mom and dad and parental information and handout about skin to skin care. And we provide two books as a part of a welcome book bag. Um, on the right is the picture of staff celebrating our second anniversary of our reading program by holding their favorite book. Next slide, please. So we track all of our uh, FCC developmental care in our electronic health record under family developmental care flow sheet. Nurses document who participated in that activity and how long. Um, I pulled the EPIC reports and to show our improvement and share them with their staff. Next slide, please. Um, so moving on to peer-to-peer -peer buddy um, support program. So we received support from patient experience that hired an expert consultant and psychotherapist and trained the veteran NICU parents and formed a buddy program. On the second anniversary, we recognized mentors as a star of the month um, for their um, commitment. And this is the picture I'm showing a, a mentor and mentee posing at the reunion. We are working on evaluation, refresher courses, and recruiting new mentors for training. Next slide, please. There are a few different ways we can connect with families after discharge. Our family advisory board, I'm working on changing the title to family partnership um, council. Um, um, we actually coordinated with the family advisory board members and they actually indicated the feeling of a disconnection of their long time NICU family after discharge. So we created a follow up phone call subcommittee and NICU reunion team also organizes the yearly reunion to connect and see the thriving NICU babies. During reunion, we recruit parents for our parent buddy program, family advisory board and QA project. Next slide, please. So this slide lists some of our challenges and how we overcome that. We had difficulty in recruiting staff for projects, poor attendance at FCC committee monthly meetings. So we created a few subcommittees and staff took ownership of the project. And FCC chair, uh, myself, we check in with, the, with them and brings the information to the leadership team. And Communication is the key for any project success. Um, so to communicate better and disseminate the information, we created a monthly newsletter and posted on the bulletin board, nurses lounge, bathroom, and sent by email. And leadership approved to provide administrative time for subcommittee work. And some staff and physician, they actually worked on their own time. And we had a few new IRs and travelers in the past year. So I created a FCC orientation checklist. Um, so and I regularly review the checklist information with staff, physicians, and trainees. As a celebration of staff's amazing work, we created a star of the month in the 2019 summer and appreciated several interdisciplinary staff every month for the past three years, posted them on the unit bulletin board and gave them a gift card. Next slide, please. This slide shows a few examples of our star of the month flyer. And in the middle is the FCC monthly newsletter. On the right is the FCC orientation checklist front and back. Next slide, please. 
This slide shows a list of different subcommittee members. As you can see, it takes a village to accomplish and without their contribution, this program would be successful. Next slide, please. We want to acknowledge um, the entire NICU team for their support in developing the FCC program. Next slide, please. Here is our contact information. Feel free to reach out to us if you have any question or need to hear more information about our program. Thank you for listening. Okay, so thank with you. that, yeah, Caroline, go for it. Okay. I was just gonna say thank you so much. It's great to hear some specific examples that I think people can really take and start to implement. Um, I just put in a link to an evaluation in the chat. If you wouldn't mind filling that out, that'll help us improve these webinars in the future. We have six more at the moment coming over the next year or so. Uh, and the next one is September the 15th, same time. Um, and this one is going to be about how to build a family advisory council or family partnership council in your NICU. Um, so join us there for that. I don't think we have any time um, today for further questions, but feel free to, to drop things in the chat and we'll find ways uh, to connect you with our family partners afterwards um, and have more chance for interaction then. Okay, um, thank you everyone for joining. See you next time. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.